Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give these, for the wonderful introduction, for all the support in having everything work out. I believe many of the people in the audience uh, have been attending the summer school on this very topic. So some of what you're going to hear has, well, much of what you're going to hear is related or covered in the summer school. However, you heard new material today and your assignment during this lecture is to figure out where what you heard today fits into the things that we've been telling you for the past three days. Okay. So there are some very important points there. Okay, so with that, um, I do like to start by giving this example of algorithmic bias. So this is a famous example. It's the residency match algorithm. Uh, students rank programs that they would like to go to. Programs rank the students that they're interested in. And the algorithm searches for and finds a stable match, which is a match in which there is no program student pair that is not matched to each other and in which each party would prefer the other member of that party to the person or the, the party that they're actually currently matched to. So the stability is that these two don't match up and run away together. And the algorithm has two roles. There are the proposers and they're the ones who receive the proposal. And either the proposers are going to be the medical schools or they are going to be the students, the programs or the students. And until 1997, it was the programs that proposed. Now the algorithm is optimal for one group and pessimal for the other. Who is it optimal for? The programs, the, programs, the proposers, the proposers. And when I was taught this algorithm as an undergraduate, the professor said, and who do you think gets to be the proposers, right? It was obviously it was gonna be the medical schools, but that was changed in 1997. In part, the article says, because of a concern about that it was unfair, unduly unfair to the candidates. It is quite interesting that a number of years later, the same person who wrote that article giving talks about this highlights instead that it was deemed to be unfair to married couples. That, and, and I know that this was a problem. I was told about this as an undergraduate, but um, uh, it was emphasized uh, late, more recently. Okay, so these algorithms are biased by design. That is, that's how the algorithm works. Everybody knows it and a choice is made and it is made publicly it is known what the biases are and who is going to get to be the advantaged group. That's not the situation that we're going to be dealing with uh, for the rest of the lecture. So in the rest of the lecture, it's an algorithmic fairness in general. We have a diverse population that differs in ethnicities, religious groups, geographic locations, medical conditions, gender, class, sexual preference, and so on. And the concern somehow is that there's a difference in the degrees of unfairness or the ways in which different groups are being treated. So you can think of this as differential unfairness or un injustice. Now, does anybody here need to, or not know, would anybody here like a brief review of what machine learning is? You all know it, great. So the, uh, the right, okay, good, so you know. So, why are algorithms unfair? You've seen, many of you have seen this slide, but there's another thing that I added in response to one of the things I heard today. So the classic reason is unrepresentative training data. Training data that does not have enough members of different minority or small population groups. Whoa, okay. Another is that algorithms are trained on labeled data and tr these labels are, represent decisions that were made in the past. If you train data that has been labeled by a biased decision maker, the data themselves now are biased, that bias gets translated into anything that the algorithm that's trying to learn actually learns. 
Um, so another problem is that data may be missing in different ways for different groups. So one of the examples we heard today was that there are people who can't afford medical treatment and therefore they forego medical treatment and therefore there is no historical medical data for them. So that's another way in which we get unfairness. And we've talked a bit about how the features themselves that are used in the data may be differentially expressive. So the foregone medical treatment, well, well there's no history of heart disease. Well, of course not. You never went to the doctor in the first place. But in addition, you can have cases where the data sort of, uh, there is a field, and the field, just a given value in the field means different things for different communities. And the classic example there is AP classes. So if you're in a wealthy district, you have a choice of taking many AP classes. If you're um, applying to college, uh, how many classes you take, you have, re you have taken and passed means something, but if you come from a poor neighborhood, then the fact that you haven't taken classes might simply mean that there were no AP classes offered. And the, another example that's well studied is um, that when decisions are being made for uh, child protective services in Allegheny County, the decision makers uh, who are deciding whether to screen a call in or screen it out, will have access to more medical histories of certain kinds for poor people. For example, for um, whether or not they have used a state-funded, uh, Medicaid-funded um, uh, alcohol treatment program. They wouldn't have access to that kind of information for wealthy people who went to private programs. And the 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 outcomes that are being recorded and optimized for uh, are another source of bias. Um, so instead of uh, determining whether somebody commits a crime and having that information, we instead only know whether this person has been rearrested. And when you think about the task, it's a completely unreasonable task. When I'm telling you that there is no, that the data are biased, there's no access to ground truth. There's no access to ground truth historically. And think about other situations in computer science where you get to check things. Like you write a program, you get to check it. Maybe you even can prove it's correct. What can you possibly prove here? All you could prove is that you followed some particular methodology for building an algorithm that is going to do forecasting or classifying based on training data. But you can't, especially if it's a predictor, if you know, I look at the prediction it makes for Mark, there is no ground truth yet. The future hasn't happened. I don't know whether this is true or false. So it's a completely impossible problem. There is no ground truth. Okay, so it's an impossible problem. Does that stop us? Of course not. So um, the, there is a paradigm uh, in, in, that started in cryptography for dealing with very, very difficult problems that are sort of social in nature and you're trying to turn them into mathematics problems where you can actually try to say something mathematical and prove something mathematical. And the starting point for all of this has to be the definition. So what does it mean to be fair? I promise you that the people in this room do not agree on the answer to that question. Again, the whole, the whole endeavor is insane because there's no ground truth. We can't even agree here. Very educated people in the same physical environment, and we can't agree here almost surely on what's fair. Nonetheless, there are two classes of definitions um, that, well, there are, two, there are two main veins of research, and we will talk about a third one later, but at the beginning, we sort of I separated out what we called group fairness conditions and individual fairness. 
So examples for group fairness conditions are just what you would guess. Uh, uh, for uh, statistical parity is that the demographics of the accepted students should be the same as in the population as a whole. Or we just heard a talk about risk assessment for pre-trial detention. And if you're assessing for flight risk, demographic parity then would be? Anybody? Well, among the people who are detained, demographic parity would say that among the people who are detained, that the, the racial mix of the people who are detained should be the same as the racial mix of the people who are being considered for detention. It's just a street statistical. It's no, yeah, okay. Um, I was recently giving a talk remotely into China. China has a population that is 48.7% female. So 48.7% female, you would expect in demographic parity that you would have at least 48.7% of the college students should be female. That's what demographic parity would say. In the context of scoring, if you imagine that you're trying to evaluate something for which there is a ground truth, but it may not be yet known. So maybe this would be a situation where you're trying to score someone to determine whether or not to test them for a certain medical condition. So they, they might have the condition or not. That's a ground truth. It's not known because the test hasn't happened yet. And balance for the positive class would say that in your scoring function, the average score that you um, assign for a positive member in demographic group A should be the same as the average score that you assign for a positive member of demographic group B. And we find that group notions are problematic. Um, so the, uh, we thought about this initially in the context of advertising. Um, and this example is you have a vegetarian restaurant. You are required to advertise equally to groups, different demographic groups. And there's this other demographic group that you don't want coming to your restaurant. And so you advertise to the vegetarians in that group, the wrong segment of the population. Uh, you could have very different distributions on people and you end up rewarding the, the minority that looks like the majority. People who are more assimilated, who have taken up hobbies that are similar to the dominant uh, class hobbies. Um, it can be very hard to audit for these sorts of things and it's difficult to know what is the right thing that you should be comparing, what are the right statistics that you should be comparing between groups. Um, and the killer for me was this uh, result that natural desiderata are mutually exclusive. And the, there are two theorems that talk about this. One of them is for classification, and the other one is for scoring uh, functions. And the scoring function version, uh, one of the authors was Sendhil Malinathan, who some of you just heard speak this afternoon. And then uh, my big, big, big question is always, which groups should we be talking about? When you want to impose statistical parities or some kind of statistical notions about fairness among groups, what should be the set of people the set of groups that you consider. So for the classification case, um, there's a very simple proof that says that no imperfect classifier can simultaneously ensure equal false positive rates, false negative rates, and positive predictive value unless the base rates in the groups are the same. So the base rates are, let's say you're um, uh, you're interested in, in I don't know, um, sickle cell status, okay? So the base rate is for your subgroup, what is the set, what is the fraction of people in the subgroup that have 
um, the sickle cell trait, let's say. So um, the positive predictive value is among those for whom you predict a, that the answer will be yes, then um, the positive predictive value is what fraction of them are actually positive. So the proof for this is very simple because the false positive rate can be expressed as the base rate P over 1 minus P and the rest of the equation you can see. And if you have two different subgroups, S and T, then the equation holds for both subgroups. And so insisting that the uh, false positive rate should be the same says that these two circle terms have to be equal to each other. Insisting that the positive predictive values should be the same uh, forces equality here. False, po false negative rates, same thing. And if you put all those equations together, it forces the base rates to be the same. Okay, so those were some of the problems with group fairness conditions. So instead, we look at individual fairness. And individual fairness says that people who are similar with respect to a given classification task or scoring task should be treated similarly by your algorithms for this task. And we'll see that formalized in a moment. Um, and it has a strong legal foundation, the idea that people who are similarly situated must be treated the same is very strong in law. And the problem, again, now there's a different problem. And the problem here is who is similar to whom for the given task. So we will need some kind of a notion of distance, or what we're calling the metric, that tells us for a given task and a given pair of individuals how dissimilar they are for that particular task. And that was very problematic, because where do you get this distance from? And that kind of uh, brought things to a halt for about six years. And then there was this big flurry of activity starting in about 2018, um, where there were all kinds of nice contributions, some of which we'll mention in a moment. Um, but I personally believe that if you have any system that people think is fair, fundamentally inside it there is a metric. And by playing with it, it's, it's like more than that. By playing with this system, you can eventually uncover what that metric is. So for those of us who heard Sinda Moynathan's talk, I think that, well, I wouldn't necessarily know in general how to get my hands on this metric. I think his work about uncovering what it is people are doing, I think that this is very suggestive for this task. I'm not saying that you'll find the right metric, but you may end up finding, when you combine what you find with what, what, what you learn with his approach about what people are actually doing, take that and combine it with what people think is fair, that may be a way toward attacking this problem. So I think this is a really, I and mean, I found the talk very, very exciting, and one of the reasons is this. So graduate students here, you know, have at it. Um, yeah, good. So individual fairness says that similar people are, uh, have to be treated similarly. And we've said we need the right notion of, of dissimilarity for the specific task. And our worry is that uh, there aren't, People aren't nicely clustered. Um, I had a class of students a couple of years ago, and it was just astonishing. There was absolutely no break in the scores that they had. It was just like this, right? So which ones, you know, how do you pull these apart and grade them? They basically all got A's, but, um, uh, you know, it was just like there was no cluster whatsoever. So the question is, you know, do you, you may think you have to draw the line somewhere. If you draw the line somewhere, you're going to have two people who are just on opposite sides of the line. One of them gets an A, the other gets a B. Or one of them gets classified yes, and the other one gets classified no. And it seems very unfair. And what did I not do with my students, but a computer scientist, in fact, would do? Well, we would randomize. Instead of assigning a decision, we assign probability distribution over the decisions. So 
um, uh, if there were you know, two very similar people, you might assign to one of them 69% chance of yes uh, and 31% and, and chance of no. And to the next one, you might do 70% chance of yes and 30% chance of no. But if they're very different, you can have very different probability distributions. And there are, different, there are various ways of measuring distances in probability distributions, and two that we've used are the total variation distance and um, uh, the L infinity metric, or the, the, di the differential privacy metric. Okay, so these decisions aren't being done in a vacuum, and there are notions of loss for different outcomes. And so the notion of loss, you know, certain kinds of mistakes can be much worse than other kinds of mistakes. And it, or, yeah, certain kinds of mistakes can be much worse than other kinds of mistakes. And there should be some way of specifying these kinds of preferences uh, into the algorithm. And so we, in, we capture that with the notion of a loss function the loss incurred by mapping individual V to outcome O for all V O pairs. And then that's it. That's kind of everything you need for a potential solution. You have a notion of distance. You have a fairness constraint. Uh, and you have loss functions. And so the idea is that you want to minimize the utility loss subject to the fairness conditions. And the perspective that's taken in this work is that the loss function is um, a soft constraint. You want to minimize it, but you don't have any hard rules. But the fairness conditions are hard constraints. And if you do this, you can write down a linear program where the goal is to find um, uh, mappings, taking individuals to probability distributions over the outcomes. And those mappings are called mu sub v for individual v. And you want to minimize the expected loss, which is the loss that you would have if you chose a random person v, and then a random outcome according to the probability distribution that you've assigned, and that's L of v naught. And the fairness conditions is this Lipschitz constraint that says that for whatever distance notion you're using, the distance between the distributions that you assign to the u and v, that difference should be bounded by the distance between u and v in your metric. Okay, and that's called the fairness linear program. And that was like 2012, and as I said, things were kind of quiet for a while, and then, uh, Around 2018, 2019, there was suddenly a flurry of work. And one of the really interesting results was this tantalizing breakthrough by Il Vento. And those of you in the class heard quite a bit about it. But um, she had three particular uh, insights that are well, worth repeating. So the first is that if you take any individual from your um, population, just call that person a representative, then information about the distances to that representative is useful information. But it may be under-reporting. It, it may give you a false sense of distance, of, of closeness. So um, to see that, take a look at H and C in the upper right. Does this actually point? Okay, let me see if I can get a pointer here. Okay, so if you look at H and C up here, they're both 0.6 away from A, but you can't conclude to, from that that they are close to each other because in this picture they're quite a bit farther from each other and they're still 0.6 away from A. And the way you resolve that is by having distances from other points and you literally get the effect of parallax that your own eyes are giving you when you're looking at uh, things in the distance. And then uh, she finds ways to generalize to unseen elements. So she has a, a, some training data, she learns the distribution, and she wants to uh, generalize to unseen data. So, um, 
that's how, so okay, going back to our fairness LP. Um, this could be a very large linear program because the number of individuals in your universe is enormous. And in fact, you're not working with the universe, you're working with a bunch of individuals. So suppose you have a bunch of individuals and you don't yet have access to the, to the distances between them. You have a bunch of individuals, but nowhere near as large as your universe. Then you could use Ilvento's technique to learn uh, the metric um, from an oracle who can, who can uh, I should have mentioned, her, that what's amazing in her work is that her oracle only needs to answer a few difficult queries, which are absolute distance queries. And the oracle instead just answers um, uh, a larger number for n individuals, n log n, queries of the form, uh, triple queries, given a, b, and c, which of b and c is closer to a. So you could, if you have a small-ish, or you have a training set, you could use your, you could use Ilvento's work to um, uh, learn a metric um, for, your, for your small set. And then you could run the fairness LP, and that would give you a, uh, a fair classifier for your training set. And then using work of Rothblum and Yona and relaxing um, um, the requirements a little bit, you can generalize your classifier to the unseen examples, not the ones in your training set, um, by relaxing to pro pro probably approximately fair and correct classifications. So, you know, we started with a sort of impossible task, which is the fairness LP. Then there was the idea for learning. Then there was the idea that you could learn on a smaller subset and train, learn distance on a small subset, then train, and then extend that to unseen examples. So it's okay to do something that seems far out there because eventually somebody else will figure out how to find the steps that get you from where you are to that far out place. So the next topic then is if you have systems that are built of pieces that are fair individually, separately, what happens to the behavior of your system as a whole? And the intuition would be that you know, fairness um, combines nicely and gracefully, and the reality is that this is not at all the case. So our favorite example for this is what we call task competitive composition. And the, what you should think about is um, uh, competition for banner advertising when you go to the New York Times website. And when you go there, the decision about what ad to show you is actually made by an auction. And different companies are bidding for your attention, to be given this shot at your attention. So um, the real life example is, um, uh, say a competition between an advertisement for a job in the tech sector, engineering job, and um, a grocery advertising company. Suppose each of, the each of those two advertisers is choosing completely fairly, according to their own proper distance metrics, um, what, 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 how much to bid on you. So, the feature set that the tech jobs advertiser is using should not include, say, if somebody is a new parent. The feature set that the grocery delivery service is using could very well and completely legitimately include that information because new parents may very well want a grocery delivery service. And that interaction causes the actual action of what ads people see to be unfair in the following sense. Because a new parent is so very valuable to the advertising service, uh, the, the delivery service, and the delivery is sticky, and you'll stay with it for a long time, they bid a lot of money. They outbid 
for your attention, the tech jobs advertisers. So for new parents, they're just not going to see the tech jobs ads. And you know, in your bones, you know this ought to be illegal. This is completely unfair and inappropriate, terribly inappropriate. And where is the blame? Whose fault is it? And whose job it is, is it to see that that is not what happens? My guess is it's the platform's job. But you know, from their perspective, hey, we are, we're not employers. I mean, this isn't our own employment issue. It's something else. And this, this kind of thing is, th there are other cases of, of uh, this sort of advertising conflict. And I guess you would see this also in other cartel situations where maybe um, a group of hiring organizations decide among themselves whom they're going to hire and um, the, the, you get some strange task competitive behaviors. And this is endemic, like intrinsic. So for any two tasks, T and T prime with non-trivial metrics, D and D prime respectively, and any tie-breaking function, not necessarily the same for each individual, uh, there exist classifiers, C and C prime, that are fair for their respective tasks, but when you combine them naively, you violate multiple task fairness. Okay. So that's most of what I want to say about classification. And now I want to turn to what we call individual probabilities, which is risk predictors assign numbers between zero and one often to individuals. And these numbers are often interpreted as probabilities. So what's the probability that it will rain tomorrow? What is the probability that this particular person X will repay the loan? What's the probability that this tumor will metastasize under that course of treatment? And the problem with all of this is that it's not clear at all what is the meaning of probability for a non-repeatable event. And this is an old problem, like uh, there are probably older references, but I read papers from 1982 um, that talk about this sort of thing. And there's a wonderful paper by um, the st statistician Philip David uh, called On Individual Risk. And he actually goes over some seven to nine different definitions of probability, trying to come up with ways of thinking about exactly this question. And I, yeah, okay. So I highly recommend the paper. Yeah. So, I was really intrigued by this problem. And one of the reasons that I was intrigued by it is, I think Dimitri mentioned that I'm also affiliated with the law school. You know, judges are using these things, say, for pretrial detention, as we just heard. What is this person's, what is the risk that this person is not going to come to trial? What does that mean? This is not a repeatable event. What is the meaning? And If you can't say what the meaning is, then you know, what is the right thing that the court should be using? What should we require of an algorithm that the court is going to use? There was a proposition here in California, which was defeated, that um, um, talked about maybe replacing the cash bail system and having uh, algorithms to determine whether somebody should be detained or not. And the law talked about how I think each county would have to audit the algorithm every couple of years to audit it for fairness. Well, what should the auditor be looking for? If we don't even know 
what the algorithm should be aiming for, because we don't have a definition of individual probability, what on earth are we supposed to be looking for? So, the natural thing to do is to say, well, okay, what does it mean then for these, to come up with numbers that sort of look right? And inspired by the theory of pseudo-randomness, we came up with the notion of so-called outcome indistinguishability. So the, to understand what this is, you need the notion of a distinguisher. And a distinguisher is pretty simple. It's an algorithm that takes some inputs. We'll say in a minute what they are. But the general notion of a distinguisher is it takes some inputs and it outputs either 0 or 1. That's its entire job in life. And when we talk about using it as a distinguisher, such an algorithm would take two different kinds of inputs. And you could imagine taking many examples of two different kinds of in inputs and seeing on examples of type 1 how often, in what fraction of the cases does the distinguisher say 1. And in examples of type 2, in what fraction of the cases does the distinguisher say 1? And if those fractions are far apart, yay, it has distinguished examples of type 1 from type 2. If those fractions are very close together, then it didn't distinguish. It fails to distinguish. So we've got a whole bunch of like wannabe distinguishers. They are algorithms. They could be specified by by, by circuits or code or neural nets or decision trees. You know, there are lots of different ways of doing it. But they're just algorithms that take inputs and they produce outputs. And now the goal is to devise some method of producing these things, which we are calling probabilities, and trying to see if we can fool our class of distinguishers. So the notion that we were proposing looks something like this. For every distinguisher, every hope for wannabe candidate distinguisher D in your collection of distinguishers, um, you're going to feed two different kinds of inputs to it. So in the, exam in the experiment on the left, we have an algorithm P tilde. It gives predictions. And then eventually the truth is revealed. So the training data has instances, outcomes, and you can apply the algorithm to the training data to see what is the predictor saying. So that's the example, the experiments on the left. The experiments on the right look pretty similar, only instead of providing actual, like this is what really happened, nature's outcomes, we have the algorithm's predictions. This is a number between 0 and 1. We view that number as a, um, as, a, you know, as a probability. And we draw from the Bernoulli distribution that has that probability of coming up heads. So this is two ways of getting pairs of predictions and outcomes. One where the outcomes are nature's outcomes, because that's in the training data. And the other where these are the outcomes that are predicted by our algorithm. By, by drawing from the distribution, the model given by our algorithm. So what we want are individual probabilities that look right to this class of distinguishers, meaning that in these two different kinds of experiments, the probabilities of outputting one for each of these distinguishers, for each one of them, the probability that it outputs one on the left versus on the right should be very similar. And if you do this, then you have um, you have what we call outcome indistinguishability. You can't distinguish nature's outcomes from the outcomes that the model predicts. Now, compare this to the traditional notion. If you go, <laughs> go back to that 1982 paper, you know, uh, if you compare this to sort of a traditional notion of um, what it means for predictions to look right, the, predict the traditional notion is more like that it boils down to making sure that um, if we were to look at nature's predictions paired with nature's outcomes, that would look like the algorithm's predictions paired with nature's outcomes. 
Now, of course, we can never get our hands on nature's predictions. So that is finessed by only looking at tests that nature essentially always passes. So then we don't need to run the experiment where we're feeding nature's predictions and nature's outcomes because we are assuming that the tests are such that whenever we feed nature's income, in, inputs, uh, predictions and nature's outcomes, we get a one. It passes the test. So in computer science, we have this notion of distinguishers where we want the behaviors to be the same even if sometimes the, the, the things don't say one with high probability. But in the old way of looking at it, there were these kind of one-sided distinguishers. We only looked at tests that nature always passes. So this shift in view has algorithmic consequences. Um, and there's a wonderful video on YouTube of a lecture by Richard Feynman in which he talks about how new laws of physics are developed. And first he says, you guess the new law. That's where the physics comes in. And then he says, you compute the consequences. So, you know, you, you have your law, you do a bunch of math and you say, what is it that I should expect to see in the real world? Then you run the experiment to see if you actually see this. If the observations from your experiment disagree with your predictions, it's wrong. Your law is wrong. In that simple statement, Feynman says, is the key to science. He also notes that if what you observe does agree with what you predict, it doesn't mean your law is right. It may mean <laughs> that you just have not yet refuted the law. And that's very much like if you fool this collection of distinguishers, it doesn't mean you've got the right probabilities. It may mean you haven't yet found the distinguisher that would be able to distinguish your predictions from reality, from what's going on. So, for us, outcome indistinguishability is kind of a nice encapsulation of the scientific method. We think of our predictor that we have built, algor our algorithm that we are constructing, that predictor is a scientific theory. It is telling us what to expect from individual instances. And so imagine for a moment, and really stress that this is imagining, that the class of distinguishers is the collection of all circuits that are of polynomial size. That's a hugely rich collection of circuits. Okay. Then, oh, and those are sometimes called the efficient algorithms. If you manage to fool all polynomial time uh, circuits, pol polynomial size circuits, then the behaviors that you predict by the theory cannot feasibly, efficiently, in polynomial time, be distinguished from the behaviors of the real world. So that's a pretty interesting predictor. There's no feasible way to falsify the theory that passes all of those efficient tests. So why did I say imagine? And the reason that you have to imagine is we can't quite do this. The basic methodology exists, and you can do a lot. Um, and there is a rich literature on using these uh, sorts of things for ranking, target-free learning, loss agnostic prediction. Uh, you saw applications, those of you who listened to Noah Dagan's talk this morning, applications of this kind of work in medicine. Um, but the complexity in terms of training data and computational time of fooling anything remotely like all polynomial size circuits is just, it's, it's, it's not doable. And that brings us to a general question of what I think of as a calculus of inclusion. Which distinguishers, what should they be testing? 
you know, you, 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 ha you can only build something to fool a given class of distinguishers. How do you, yeah, how do you focus on choosing which ones those are? Now, I, sh I went a little too quickly on the last slide. So when I said the methodology exists, there was a seminal paper of Ebert Johnson, Kim Rheingold, and Rothblum that suggests multi-calibration and outcome indistinguishability is very, very closely tied to multi-calibration. And so in multi-calibration, instead of having distinguishers, you have sets of, you can think of this as sets of people and sets of instances. And again, the issue comes up, which sets should you be looking at? Um, and who decides? And how do they decide? And now, what is the connection to Sendel's lecture? Name in two words an example from his lecture that fits perfectly here. Fuller faces. Who would have thought that you should be calibrating or paying attention to which mugshots showed pictures of people with full faces rather than narrow faces? Who would have thought that the distinguishers, that the class of distinguishers should include that? But it should. Based on his lecture, it should. So how do we get our hands on these things? And, you know, <laughs> I think about kind of the cognitive load on people who, who, who are supposed to defend themselves. I'm guessing the people with narrow faces, it never occurred to them that they were being treated a certain way because their faces were narrow. I mean, it's just, it's just so wild. All right. And I guess, um, one thing that has to be said about this whole vein of work, which I said that initially we have the group fairness conditions and we have the individual fairness conditions, and now this is somewhere in between because it's looking at lots and lots and lots of different sets that, over, that intersect arbitrarily. So it's this multi-X uh, framework. Um, what we get from these sorts of things are descriptions of what's happening and not prescriptions about how to make things better in general. However, descriptive can be really great. So here's an example from Noah Dagan's talk this morning where um, she was talking about cardiac, cardiac and osteoporotic risk prediction. And she highlights a bunch of different demographic groups according to, I can't even see. You can probably see it, it's too small on my screen. But it'll have age and sex and various other things. And she ends up with 360 subgroups. And they looked at the predictors that they had. And the, for each subgroup, there is a measure of how well calibrated the predictor is on this subgroup. And here, one is the measure that you really want. And um, you can see that there's quite a bit that's far away from one. And when they use this technology, this multi-calibration technology, the picture changes to this. So much, much tighter concentration at the good point in the work. OK, and I will stop there, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>